You will hear a number of different recordings, and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions, and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four parts. Now turn to part one. Part one. You will hear a conversation between a career counselor and a graduate student on career choices available to her and on making an informed choice. Before you listen, look at questions one to three. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to three. Hello, how can I help you today? Hello, my name is Azel. I called yesterday and was given an appointment for this time. Hmm, ah yes, Azel. Okay, so what brings you here, Azel? Well, I've completed my bachelor's degree and I'd like to get some counselling about what I should do next. I see. Do you have any specific plans in mind? Well, I don't know, actually. I'm not sure what I want to do. Well, that's not unusual and happens with a lot of students. Are you thinking of higher studies, such as a master's degree? Or are you thinking of pursuing your career? I always thought I'd complete my higher studies by getting a master's degree, but the fee structure is so high now. I feel like I'm being pushed to explore other options. I'd like to do some economical course, after which I can get a job. Yes, that is absolutely true about university fees skyrocketing. Yes, that, and the fact that I'm really not sure that after completion of a course, a job is insured. I think it's because the courses offered by universities are more theoretical than practical. Well, I think a foundation course at a community college would be appropriate for you. First, this is because the fee structure is very low at the college as compared to the fee structure of universities. Secondly, the courses are not full-time, and you can work a part-time job as the classes are only two or three times a week. Furthermore, with a foundation course, you get real-time experience in the workplace where you can develop your employability as well as professional skills. Another aspect is that size of the batch is small, so that each student gets more time and personal attention. That sounds good, but I do have some doubt. Does one get the same qualifications as one would get at a university? You would get a foundation degree and not an honors degree after the completion of the course. But in a university, you would get the honors degree upon completion. However, you can always progress to an honors course if you successfully complete the foundation course. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 4 to 10. Now listen carefully and answer questions 4 to 10. So what sort of course are you thinking of taking? Is there any field in which you have a special interest? Well, I was thinking of going into business or management or something in the commerce field. Do you have courses in that stream? Well, we don't have the exact course of business management. But yes, we do offer a course in managing public services I think that might interest you, as the public sector is the biggest employer in the country. A lot of young, talented individuals like you can make their place at good positions. Also, the skill sets you would acquire through this course would be the same that you would get by doing a course on business management. Is that so? Can you give me some details about the course? Sure. There are different modules that you can take. Mm, for example, there is one titled Organizational Behavior. This, I think, might interest you. Organizational behavior. What is that about? In this course, 
you would learn about both the practical and the theoretical nature of organizations and certain things about organizations such as how they are set up and how the structure of an organization is created. There is another module known as people management that includes principles of management strategies for leading groups of people. The next module is individual and group behavior which emphasizes on the behavior of people and how people can be motivated. Finally, another module that is very important is financial resources that emphasizes on budgeting and planning. Wow, that does sound good. This subject looks good also. Applied psychology for public services. Yes, that is an interesting subject. The subject is linked to individual and group behavior module one. It focuses on the psychological factors such as stress and memory, and other aspects of psychology as it is applied in the public sector. Is it a practical course? Yes, I can assure you that this subject revolves around a practical approach. What are the prerequisites for admission to this course? You need good grades in both math and English and good aptitude with reasoning skills. I have a B in math and an A in English. That's perfect. What about your reasoning skill scores? Well, I need to take that exam. Can you tell me the minimum score I need for the course? Yes, you need a minimum of 60 points, along with clearing the sectional cutoffs. Okay, that doesn't sound to be too much of a problem. And I'm sure I can achieve that. May I take one of these brochures? Certainly. All the best. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to part two. Part two. You are about to hear a radio show in which the guest chef is talking about pizza. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 14. Now, listen to the first part of the talk and answer questions 11 to 14. Buon pomeriggio! That's good afternoon in Italian. The guest on our show today is the celebrated Italian chef, Luigi Napoli. He owns Mama's Cucina here in the town and specializes in everyone's favorite Italian dish, pizza. Thank you, Chef Luigi Napoli, for gracing our show. Over to you. Pizza is loved by one and all, and it is a very versatile dish. This means that you can add whatever you like to it. But the most important part of the pizza, and what really makes pizza pie a pizza pie, is the crust or base. The base is such an important aspect of pizza that it can either make or break a pizza. If you have a good base, you will have a good pizza. Now, let us see how to make a great pizza base, and it's very easy. Making pizza dough from scratch takes just a little effort, and it is not as hard as it looks. It's really simple once you get the hang of it. Please watch closely, because there are some tricks. But once you get these, you'll have made an unbelievably great pizza crust. First, let us put pinch dry yeast, half a teaspoon of sugar, one teaspoon of flour, and a quarter cup of water in a small bowl. We'll then stir these ingredients until a smooth texture is obtained. Now, we'll put the mixture aside until it doubles in size. We call this the sponge. Meanwhile, in another bowl, a larger one that is, let us add two cups of well-sifted flour and half a teaspoon of salt. Mix this thoroughly and then make a hole in the centre of the mixture. Okay, 
When the sponge is the right size, we will pour it into the centre of the mixture in the larger bowl. Along with this, we'll add one teaspoon of olive oil, two tablespoons of milk, and half a cup of lukewarm water. We'll knead this dough thoroughly until it becomes smooth and elastic. Mmm, now, when it gets really smooth, the next step is to roll the dough into a neat little ball. Just roll it along until it becomes a nice ball. Now, let's place this back into the bowl, but first we need to dust the bowl with flour so the dough doesn't stick to the bowl. After placing it in the bowl, brush the ball with oil so that crust doesn't develop. This is because we're going to leave this in a warm place for two to three hours so that it can double in size. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 15 to 20. Listen and answer questions 15 to 20. Now, in order to save time, let's take the already prepared mixture that we left to double in size about two hours ago, and here it is. Okay, now, let's preheat our oven to 220 degrees Celsius and place a large flat baking tray on the bottom shelf. Meanwhile, we are going to take the dough and on a flour dusted surface, we are going to knead it some more to get any air out of it. We just need to knead it for a minute or two, and now we're all done. Now, we're going to separate this dough into three portions. We can use the dough immediately, or we can wrap it in plastic wrap and store it in the fridge or the freezer until we need it. Now, since we are going to use it straight away, We'll place one of these balls on the surface we've prepared for this and using the palm of our hand, flatten it into a round shape. Now as we do this, use your fingertips as I am doing, pushing out the dough. We're going to keep doing it until it is approximately 5 millimeters thick, leaving only a slightly thicker edge to prevent the toppings from running off. You can also use a rolling pin if you want to. Finally. We'll place it on a sheet of aluminium foil that has been brushed with olive oil and dusted with flour. We'll let this stand for about 15 to 20 minutes. Now let's take out the pre-warmed tray from the oven. Place one of the pizza bases on it now and then put it back into the oven for 8 to 12 minutes until it becomes a golden brown. That is the end of part 2. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to part three. Part three. Now, listen to a conversation between two students discussing an academic pun practical project. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now, listen to the first part of the conversation and answer questions 21 to 25. Hi Simon, how are you? You look down. Oh, hi Diana. I'm okay. Well, 
Actually, I'm just worried about this project that Professor Flowers has assigned me. I mean, well, I think she did it deliberately. She knows that I don't like adventure, and that I'm not very outgoing. She deliberately gave me the topic of adventures for my project, and I just don't know what to do. Maybe she wants you to explore new things, and come out of that cocoon you're living in. Perhaps she wants you to challenge your abilities, so that you can really learn something, especially about yourself. Maybe, but I'm totally clueless as to what to write about. I think I can help you with that. I'm a total adventure freak, and I've done a number of adventure sports. I'll be happy to guide you. Really? That would be really nice. Now, I can only guide you in order for you to make your paper effective. I think you're going to need some practical experience and exposure. For now, I'll tell you about all the various adventure sports. Okay. Maybe after listening to you, I might be able to try one or two of these. Good. Now listen. An adventure sport is the term used for activities that involve a high level of risk. Some may consider these activities as dangerous because they may involve speed, height, a lot of physical exertion, and other risks. I knew it. If these things are so dangerous, why do people do these things for fun? Well, I would say um, that it's not only the risk, but the adventure and challenge involved. You can really learn a lot about yourself. So, what are the sports that are termed as adventure sports? The only one I could think of is bungee jumping. Oh, there are many. Let's see. There's skydiving, surfing, paragliding, river rafting, rock and mountain climbing, mountain biking. And so many more. Oh, tell me more about these sports. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions twenty-six to thirty. Now, listen to the second part of the discussion and answer questions 26 to 30. Well, these sports help you to expand and test your limitations. The basic motive is to have fun and adventure. Okay, I want to hear more. Now, the thing that differentiates these sports from traditional sports is the fact that all these sports are undertaken individually and not as part of a team. Therefore, all the risk, fear, and tension is yours alone. That is the real test, the test of a person's determination and perseverance. So you do these alone? I thought people did these together. Well, yes, people do these in groups, but all the effort is yours alone. Let's take rock climbing, for example. It's really nice to go on a journey in the lap of nature, experience the terrain, the cliffs, engaging in short climbs and descents. Really, you challenge your physical and psychological strength. So being among nature is refreshing. What about water sports? Are they also part of adventure sports? I like to swim. If so, I might take them up. Sure, if you love water, then scuba diving can be an awesome experience. There are many training centers for this. And honestly, I love it. It's really quiet and peaceful, with many unexpected things coming your way. You might come across different water creatures, beautiful and colorful fishes, and at times, you'll find some surprises too. It's an adventure where you need the proper knowledge. So yes, you do need proper training. Otherwise, you can put yourself in danger. That sounds interesting. There are other water sports too, like river rafting. That can be dangerous. So can kayaking. But if you do it out in a lake or quiet body of water, it can be a good exercise for your body and fill you with tranquility. Thanks, Diana. You've been really helpful. At least I've found a direction in which to proceed. I can definitely experience some of the water sports and end up writing a really nice paper. Thank you again. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turn to part 4. Part 4. Now, listen to part of a lecture where the professor is discussing a newly discovered distant galaxy. Before the lecture begins, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen to the lecture and answer questions 31 to 40. Today we're going to throw some light on a newly discovered distant galaxy. According to Johann Richard, the lead authority of a new study, a distant galaxy has been discovered that began forming stars just 200 million years after the Big Bang. This challenges existing theories of how soon galaxies started forming and evolved in the initial years of the universe. It could even resolve the mystery of how the hydrogen fog that occupied the early universe was cleared. Richard's team found the galaxy in recent observations from the Hubble Space Telescope and confirmed it with observations from the NASA Spitzer Space Telescope. They measured its distance using the WM Keck Observatory in Hawaii. The galaxy is seeable through a flock of galaxies called Abel 383. Its powerful gravity changes the position of light rays almost like a magnifying glass. The change of alignment of the galaxy, the cluster, and the Earth amplifies the light coming to us from this distant galaxy and enables astronomers to make detailed observations. Without this gravitational lens, it would not have been possible to observe this galaxy even with today's largest telescopes. After spotting the galaxy in Hubble and Spitzer images, the team carried out spectroscopic observations with the Keck 2 telescope in Hawaii. By closely examining the spectrum, the team could make detailed measurements of its redshift and infer information about the properties of its component stars. The galaxy's redshift is 6.027, which means we see it as it was when the universe was about 950 million years old. This does not make it the most remote galaxy ever detected, as there have been several with confirmed redshifts of more than 8, and one with an estimate of 10, that places it 400 million years earlier. However, the newly discovered galaxy has dramatically different characteristics from other distant galaxies that have been observed, which generally shine boringly only with young stars. According to co-author Aichi Igami, when they looked at the spectra, two things were obvious. The redshift placed it very early in cosmic history, but the infrared detection from the Spitzer telescope also showed that the galaxy was composed of surprisingly old and relatively faint stars. This told them that the galaxy was made up of stars already nearly 750 million years old, thereby pushing back the history of its formation to about 200 million years after the Big Bang much further than what was expected. Dan Stark, another co-author, extends his thanks to the amplification of the galaxy's light by the gravitational lens, which provided excellent quality data. Their work confirms some earlier observations that had hinted at the presence of old stars in early galaxies. This suggests that the first galaxies have been around for a lot longer than previously thought. The discovery has implications beyond the question of when galaxies were first formed, and may also help to explain how the universe became transparent to ultraviolet light in the first billion years after the Big Bang. In the early years of the cosmos, a diffused fog of neutral hydrogen gas blocked ultraviolet light in the universe. Some source of radiation must therefore have progressively ionized the diffused gas, 
clearing the fog to make it transparent to ultraviolet rays as it is today, a process known as reionization. Astronomers believe that the radiation that generated this reionization must have come from galaxies, but so far, nowhere near enough of them have been found to provide the necessary radiation. This discovery may help to solve this mystery. It seems probable that there are in fact far more galaxies out there in the early universe than they previously estimated. It's just that many galaxies are older and less visible, like the one that has just been discovered. According to Jean-Paul Kniebb, if this unseen flock of faint elderly galaxies is indeed out there, these could provide the missing radiation that made the universe transparent to ultraviolet light. As of today, these galaxies can only be discovered by observing through massive clusters that act as cosmic telescopes. In coming years, the NASA ESA-CSA James Webb Space Telescope, scheduled for launch later this decade, will specialize in high-resolution observations of distant, highly red-shifted objects. It will therefore be in an ideal position to solve these mysteries once and for all. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.